Welcome to another ROI panel discussion. This one's on cybersecurity. I'm Tom Bergeron. I'm the editor of ROI NJ. I know all of you guys are subscribers and read our email every day, right? All set. Good. We've got that taken care of. So thank you. We appreciate your support. Let me go through today and introduce our four panelists today. Um, we have a pretty good discussion, so I'm going to start from left to right. Jim Matola, Director of Forensic Investigation and Risk Mitigation Services of Sobel, but I think he's got an announcement on that. We'll let Jim make him say himself. <laughs> in perfect timing, that was Bob Anderson, who's an attorney with Linda Berry. <laughs> uh, then we have Bill Gajetsky, um, president of Winning Strategies ITS, and Keith Gilbertson of Management Liability Practice. So for those of you who know the uh, ROI format, what we're going to do is we're going to give each of these guys uh, 90 seconds to two minutes to explain who they are and what they do. We're going to do a couple of questions there, and then we want to go to a lot of audience, audience questions. Uh, we know there's a lot of interest out there and a lot's going on. So let me start here, and I'm going to go with Jim. Good morning. Let us know what you got. Good morning. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Tom. So my name is Jim Batola, and I am the director of, of uh, Forensic Investigations and Risk Mitigation Services at Sobel & Company. Uh, some of you may know Sobel & Company. We're a mid-sized CPA firm located in the heart of Livingston, New Jersey. Um, part of my practice area has really focused on fraud and information security. Uh, we, our clients are or I would say mid-market clients, and I kind of qualify mid-market as anything from $5 million to $100 million, uh, in revenue. And I, I really, what I see as part of our practice area uh, is that there is a lot of risk out there, just kind of like this ice on the floor, right? That's a risk. Uh, and we, we got an insurance guy here, too, so we're all Exactly. <laughs> so I'm very leery of risk. So, you know, what I, what I try to help our clients with is how do we protect information and how do we prevent fraud from happening? And, you know, it's very difficult in, a, in the mid-market where uh, most businesses really don't have the resources, the expertise uh, to do so. And my perspective is I come from a law enforcement background. I spent 26 years with the U.S. Secret Service uh, uh, investigating financial fraud and cybercrime uh, throughout the world. It's a tricky, tricky uh, endeavor to try to uh, attribute the, the bad actors and to arrest them. Um, so, you know, going from the enforcement side to the prevention side uh, and to the response side has been very interesting. As Tom said, uh, this is my last week at Sobel. No, they didn't fire me. Uh, <laughs> I've decided to take another position uh, with Porzio Compliance Services as director, I'm sorry, a vice president of uh, data privacy, investigations, and security, kind of focusing more in this area, which I think is very challenging, interesting, and a very important area. I'm Bob Anderson. I'm uh, an attorney with Linda Berry, McCormick, Astorbrook, and Cooper. We're a 50-attorney law firm uh, with our main headquarters in Westfield, New Jersey. Uh, I'm also the co-chair of our cybersecurity and data privacy group. Uh, we also tend to serve mid-market type companies. Um, that's our niche. And uh, I'm looking forward to having a nice conversation today. And as Tom asked, I'm going to keep it short. Full disclosure, the IRS called me this morning, and I may or may not be detained. Uh, <laughs> I have to pay them large sums of money. If that happens during the presentation, I apologize. Uh, I'm, from, uh, I'm from Winning Strategies. We're a... Uh, full-service IT provider in Newark, New Jersey. We've been in business since, uh, since 2000. Uh, we have three divisions. We have a project management division. Uh, we have an enterprise networking and managed service division. Uh, and we have a, a, a web, uh, a custom web division. Um, we also manage and maintain a uh, SSAE uh, compliant data center. So we, uh, we are constantly protecting our own facility. Um, and we are, uh, we're on the front lines of, of the fight against the cyber criminals right now. Um, we're, uh, we're receiving the calls. Our help desk is, uh, is receiving the calls from a, a practice uh, where, you know, the, uh, the owner of the company has set up their own, uh, their own servers and equipment because uh, that's what they do, and, you know, they, they like doing In a that closet, addition. we hear. That's where that's you right. want to put your <laughs> own right. servers in a closet. Exactly. Um, to, to large state and local governments that, uh, 
uh, that have you know full IT staff uh, that that are all facing this. So the point is, no one is immune, uh, large and small, and uh, we're all learning right now. So looking forward to uh, to to hearing from the different industries and um, and talking about you know my my expertise and my uh, uh, involvement in it you know in the last ten years. Okay. Thanks, Will. Uh, so my name is Keith Gilbertson. I work for, uh, I'm an insurance broker at the firm Arthur J. Gallagher. Um, we are the fourth largest insurance broker in the world. And we handle, uh, we work with clients of all different si of all different sizes. So from your small owner operator business all the way up and down the, the Fortune 500. We also have a benefits division where we work with our clients uh, to administer benefits. Uh, and we work very closely with that side of the house. Um, our, uh, my, my specific expertise is in, uh, I'm part of the management liability practice and cyber liability practice. It's a group of about, say about 240, 245 individuals across the country who are in the marketplace every day uh, negotiating, uh, negotiating insurance contracts on behalf of our clients for you know, cyber liability, uh, management liability, and, uh, and products like that. We are the thought leaders. We, we put out white papers. We provide our clients with all sorts of different resources to enable, uh, to uh, as part of this sort of, I guess, supply chain of, of cybersecurity for uh, for our clients. So, so, uh, so, thank you for having me, and uh, look forward to a good discussion. All right. So, let's start with something that's in the news. The city of Atlanta right now is being held hostage by a cyber attack. Um, let's talk about what happened, how it happened, what they should be doing, what they should have done. Who wants to jump in a little bit with the background right now on what's going on with Atlanta, explaining where they're at and how they got there? Uh, well, just as general background, the city of Atlanta was subject to a ransomware attack, and a ransomware attack is essentially malicious software that gets into the system. It encrypts all the data in the system, and uh, a lot of times the purveyors of these are very colorful and they will put up a skull and crossbones on the uh, computer screens with a countdown clock and say, if you don't send us money uh, within a certain time frame, we are going to destroy all your information. And if you do send us money, we will um, give you the keys in order to allow you to unlock the background here and get your uh, data back. Um, what's happening is, uh, as, a, as a first step, um, or at least what should be happening behind the scenes, is if an attack of this sort happens, the first person, and this is counterintuitive, but the first person you should really be calling is your attorney. And the reason for that is you're going to conduct an investigation to determine what's gone on within the computer system. That uh, investigation is going to show that there were problems that allowed this to come in in the first place. And typically, this, uh, a ransomware attack like this gets in because someone sends out an email or a colorful attachment to employees at your firm, or in this case, the city of Atlanta, and they make it sound, um, and they've gotten much more sophisticated than they used to, they make it sound like this is genuinely something legitimate. Um, and uh, it used to be that you would get the Nigerian prince email and everybody would sort of laugh and, and nothing happened. Nowadays, they will actually look at your uh, websites, they'll look at um, conferences that people may have gone to, everybody's interested in promoting uh, what they're doing. and they'll get information that somebody went to a certain conference, then they'll send an email saying, I was at the conference too, I was very impressed with what you did, um, could you take a look at my presentation? And you are trying to be helpful and nice for somebody who uh, went to your conference, you click on it, all of a sudden the malware gets in. It uh, maybe takes a little time to get around the system, but at some point it gets to critical mass and it shuts down everybody's computers. So I get how this works, but let's talk about, this isn't Spacely Sprockets. This is, this is the city of Atlanta. This is a large entity, right? So, so how does you assume the city of Atlanta and you assume the federal government would have some sort of protections against this? Jim's already shaking his head and he's thinking those are the last people that have it. So let's talk about how it doesn't matter big or small. Jim, how, how, does, that, how does that happen? How does it? Did, did you say Spacely's Rockets? <laughs> Always a good Rockets? Jetsons reference works Jetsons in the morning. Jetsons reference, whoa. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, uh, that was pretty good, Tom. Uh, so, you know, I've actually had the pleasure of um, being part of a response team for a city in New Jersey who had a similar incident. And I can, I can tell you that what I found to be the most interesting uh, was how all the services for this particular city were connected to each other. What I mean by that, fire, EMS, police, and then of course, cities receive payments and they make payments, right? They receive payments from uh, constituents and they, they make payments to employees. So when you have this type of a, a situation which is similar to Atlanta, you know, one of the things that I found, again, very interesting was that it really just kind of grinded you know, the business of the, of the municipality to a halt. They, they stopped. And when we went through in this particular uh, response, you know, we had to prioritize where we were going to focus our, um, our resources first. What, what broken stuff did we have to fix first? And of course, it was anything that, that has to do with life, anything that has to do with police, fire, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of the thing that we went through first. You know, you can always, um, you know, go to a backup system and start like writing checks and putting them in the mail. Uh, there's other ways to do that, but it's just that everything's so interconnected. And the other, I guess, my takeaway from from that experience was how how little funding was available for upgrades. More of a technology piece, right? How things were not done, uh, how antiquated, you know pieces of, of firmware and software were still running in the environment and there was really no plan to upgrade those, to patch those, to do some of the things that technology do because, again, it's a, it's a government organization, limited resources, budget, funding, et cetera, et cetera. And that's kind of one of my, for my takeaway in that piece. Maybe Bill can so, jump yeah. in. Bill, let's go to the IT portion and then we're going to get the insurance angle. Yeah, definitely. And especially the municipalities. Uh, you know, they're, they're try, trying to make things more efficient. They're trying to connect. Uh, they're trying to connect their different uh, uh, divisions. Uh, doctors are trying to connect directly now with hospitals on the same systems. Uh, and, you know, there was a rush to do that within the last five years to, to again, for, you know, efficiency reasons. But at the same time, I think what wasn't taken into account was the exposure that they opened themselves up to um, with, with the level of access that each of those accounts had in those different systems. Um, and kind of the, the forethought that needed to go into it because at that time there wasn't so much cybersecurity. You weren't having people in your systems trying to, trying to encrypt everything and, and bring uh, entire servers down. So uh, from, from the IT standpoint, and this is something that uh, Bob had brought up and, uh, in, our, in our discussion earlier was that you are already behind in a situation like that because someone, a, an attacker, or a, a, an actor as they're, they're called, has been in your system now for 200 plus days uh, before they even let themselves know that they're there uh, or they, uh, they're discovered by some audit or policy. So you're already behind in that, uh, in that situation um, and you need to be uh, uh, mitigating, mitigating the risks before that. Um, so, yeah, go ahead and have uh, more points on that. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, so, from an insurance perspective, um, you know, you want to make sure that your insurance product has, as we call it, the, the cyber extortion insuring agreement. So, um, I would say an overwhelming percentage of the cyber products out there should ab will have this, and you should absolutely make sure that your broker is negotiating enhancements to that insuring agreement. One being... Um, just typically your insuring agreement is going to make sure that subject to the retention, as I, insurance people like to say, subject to the retention, um, you will have uh, the costs associated with someone like, like Will or, or Jim uh, coming on the scene or either accessing your system remotely or, or coming on your scene and saying, listen, this is the type of hold they have on your network um, and maybe we can get them off, maybe we can't. Um, and and uh, they basically will able to assess the situation. Um, after that, the, the insurance company never really is going to say whether or not you should make this payment. They sort of take a third-party approach there. But the policy will respond for uh, it, however the payment is made. So essentially, uh, a lot of these, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, a lot of the payments are, are Bitcoin or cryptocurrency associated. So the policy will uh, 
provide you with the costs associated with a cryptocurrency consultant because a lot of these a lot of these entities especially public entities I'm sure um, you know they don't know where to go get Bitcoin uh, so they're so they reach out to a consultant and that that consultant puts them in touch with the marketplace and then the um, you know the, the the entity will make that payment with the consent of the insurer if that's appropriate so from an insurance standpoint when you hear about the Atlanta attack Mm -hmm. Your first thought is, I hope they had what? That's yeah. a, if, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm brought in there and this is a policyholder, the first thing yeah. I'm looking for is A, B, and C. Did they have it? Let me see where this stands. Where's, where's the first th thing that goes through your mind when you hear about it from the insurance background? Well, I just selfishly, I'm thinking I, I hope they have coverage for this. And, and where that coverage would be found in the, is in the cyber extortion uh, insurance agreement, which, which, as I mentioned, is, is something that should be on most policies. Um, and, uh, but even if they've left themselves completely exposed, mm -hmm. done all of the, not done all the things that they needed to do, if they have cyber extortion, you're still going to help them cover it as opposed to saying, hey, guys, we told you to do A, B, and C. You didn't do it. So I yeah. appreciate the extortion attempt, but you left yourself open. No, that, that's a great point, Tom. I think all your, your security controls are all documented in the submission you provided to the carrier. So... What they do is they say, okay, these folks are not, you know, um, encrypting their data. That's, that's on, a, on a very low end. It's, it's tough to find coverage for folks who are not doing any sort of encryption, even low-level encryption. Um, but the premium is associated with the risk profile. So if there's a chance, if there's a situation where, um, you know, this application comes in and they're, they're not doing a lot of the things that carriers like to see, the premium goes up. And then that's the gamble that the insurance company plays. Like, okay, I'm going to get this premium, um, but there's a decent chance that these folks might be viewed as low-hanging fruit to a bad actor. So, Bob, let me turn to you real quick and talk about from the legal standpoint. So we bring in the insurance company, and they give me 35 things that I need to be doing, right? And you're going to look at it and you say, okay, these five make sense. These five I don't understand, but come on, I can't do all 35. I'm going to pick and choose. I'm going to leave some off. And whether, it's, whether I understand it or whether it's low-hanging fruit, invariably they're not going to hit all of the recommendations. So now you're being brought in from the legal aspect. There's been a breach, and you're looking at this thing saying, they told you to do these 35. You only did 11 of them. What's your advice to them at that point? You should have called your attorney earlier. Because, <laughs> uh, Let's be very is... clear on this. We want to give a lot of business to attorneys because yeah. they... <laughs> There, there is um, attorney-client privilege, and if when you're starting out uh, your program or reviewing your program, typically, and the insurance company will typically ask for this, they want you to do penetration testing. Have an outsider who's friendly try to get into your system, look at what the vulnerabilities are, look at where the weaknesses are, and then that, they will produce a report showing, as Tom said, the 35 weaknesses you have. What you want to do before you get that done, have your attorney come in, an outside attorney, and you have them be the one that orders the report so that this is a report that's being uh, provided in connection with attorney uh, recommendations to the company on legal issues. And if you have done that, then potentially this report is protected by attorney-client privilege. That way, when you get sued by the many, many people who come out of the woodwork after one of these incidents has happened, um, if you don't have that attorney-client privilege, you're sitting there with this report that says, we specifically knew there were 35 problems, we decided to deal with five, and we let the rest roll. That's going to be Exhibit A in the plaintiff uh, filing against you. And the same thing is going to happen when you actually have an incident. You're going to have to investigate what happened Again, it may seem counterintuitive to get the attorneys before the tech guys, but have the attorneys call the tech guys to get them in to do a forensic examination of exactly what has actually happened and um, who, what data has been touched, accessed, stolen, whatever. And if you have it, again, through the attorneys who are trying to give you legal advice based on that, um, that's potentially protected by attorney-client privilege. So those are two steps. Not just in a lawsuit, but people like Keith are dying to get a hold of look at, look, hey, here's what you were told and you didn't do it from an insurance standpoint. That helps your case tremendously, correct? Well, I'm always trying to help the client out. So, so 
but yeah, that's, I mean, it's a really good point because it's not just, it could, it's not just your potentially affected individuals, it's, it's the government too, right? The Department of Labor, the New York Department of Financial Services are all very interested in how you're doing your blocking, blocking and tackling. If you're just taking, you know, five or six recommendations and, and, and handling those because, you know, that's the way, you know, that, those are the funds you have. We speak back to Atlanta and the, and the municipality, how they don't have unlimited funding. I mean, no company has unlimited funding, but don't you think, I mean, I would say a public entity is probably on the lower end of that, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, essentially, I think, I think the, that attorney-client privilege is a, is a really great point and something that we, that we do reference to our clients. I think we're going to find out how much unlimited funding Facebook has in a little bit with their little cyber yeah, breach. Yeah, I agree. We asked for questions early. We got one, so let's go regarding the data that's outside of your network. So obviously, a lot of uh, cloud-based services, whether it's on AWS or somewhere else, uh, how does one go about, I mean, I understand the process of getting audits on an annual basis from different providers, but do you see an issue with uh, the, the actual entities that provide you with the services for storing and managing that data and not having the proper audit protocols in place? Because you can certainly, if we did an audit internally, so we have you know, Firepower Assist, we have AMP services, we have Insurance company gave us this risk analytics toolbox. It's great. All, everything's up to date. It's patched. However, we have all these services somewhere out in the cloud, and every single one of these services are managing our data. And uh, what we're doing now is what kind of data are they managing? Is it high-level, sensitive Social Security numbers, or is it sort of student data? And if so, how do we make sure that every single one of our partners, if you will, is actually following the proper NIST or sort of standards that are required to protect our own interests? And how does that fall within the, the, the realm of insurance and liability? So if something were to happen with data that was sort of breached with a third party uh, and we did not, for example, use Experian or they don't use Experian as a, as a certifying uh, entity, um, how does one go about to, is there a, a, a company, a, a medium that can help us vet this whole process to make sure, you know, I need, uh, I think for the insurance people here, SAS 740, there's sort of different standards that are used for auditing purposes. How does one go about doing that to ensure the outside? Uh, is Jump in. Bob, do you want to speak to the indemnity uh, agreement uh, potentially? Well, uh, in, in the big picture, if you've outsourced uh, your data, um, you're still responsible for it. And so um, the question in, in general um, would be whether you took reasonable steps uh, in protecting that data in the arrangement that you make. And the place to do that is up front in the contract with that party to make sure that it has all the protections that you need to establish based on whether you're a regulated industry or whether you're not and just are subject more to a reasonableness uh, NIST kind of a standard that um, that those protections are appropriate for the kind of uh, data that you have and um, you also have, you know, obviously the connection uh, so that there's uh, transmission uh, risks so that those connections have to be secure. Uh, the data in the server area itself has to be secure. Um, but you have to do that up front. And typically, uh, cloud ser service companies will hand you, this is our standard contract, you know, do you want us or do you not? Do you want to sign or do you not? And you look it over and it may look okay, but you really have to make sure that it has everything that you need in order to protect yourself from liability. Yeah, the, I think there's two things uh, along, the, uh, along the lines of, I think we just heard. One is I think you have to have a right to audit in that contract, right? And the other thing is there's this a such thing as a SOC 2 report that's pretty much an industry standard, uh, you know, and I would ask that, that provider, hey, let me, see your, you know, let me see your SOC 2 report. You know, basically an attestation, um, usually these are done by accounting firms. Uh, Sobel doesn't do them, but there are firms that do do them, you know, uh, where it'll, it'll basically, you'll have an independent, you know, third party will go in and make sure that they're doing what they say that they're doing, you know, and to protect that, that information. So there are ways to do that, but like, you know, you have to, you have to build that into the contract, uh, you know, and you, and you have to look at it from a risk perspective, you know, am I getting a great deal? Are they going to, you know, is it going to cost more? Well, you know, if you want to do that, well, it's going to cost more. I mean, I, I think at this point you have to make that this is, if you want to do business with us, this is important. This is what you have to do. But also I think you need to, again, dive deep into the contracts because a lot of times what we've, we've seen is that those providers 
aren't doing what they say they're doing? And then what happens if they go out of business? Right? Where is your information? You know, can you get it back from them? You know, so there's a lot of, lot of risk there. Um, and it does, again, I think this is a thing where an integrated approach is necessary. You need an attorney. You need an IT person, right? Because someone has to val validate and verify that their information is what it is, and you need you know some sort of attestation and to work through that to protect yourself, to cover yourself, because it's about your business, right? It's the continuity of your business. Let's bring in the IT perspective. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and the the point uh, as a managed service provider is that we are partners with our clients. Our clients know uh, what you know, business regulations they have, FINRA compliances, things like that. And these cloud providers know, Microsoft knows, Citrix knows. They know that they need to be compliant and they know that a big selling point for their product is uh, that, that they can um, provide that uh, to, to their potential customers. So, um, you know, for us, it's, we see, we see a, a very strong push to the cloud and we see everybody wants to, everybody wants to be in a cloud and they want to integrate um, and before that's done, what's, what's important is that you sit down with your, uh, with your IT provider and you, and you have those discussions about, about the application and you say, all right, well, you know, is this application, this cloud application uh, and the, the uh, infrastructure that it's running on, does it have compliances? Um, and, you know, are the, are the encryptions in there? And, okay, how are people accessing? Where are they accessing it from? Are they accessing it from... Uh, computers that are only in the office. Do you only have desktops? No, you want to be mobile? Okay, now you're on laptops and you're on cell phones. What are the, what are the um, uh, compliances, what are the applications that you're using now to make sure that those devices that might even be a BYO policy, you know, might be uh, devices that the company doesn't have, a, uh, that, that the company is not issuing to its employees. Uh, how are you, how are you, uh, locking those down too, so it it goes it goes from the cloud uh, and all of the compliances that 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 application might have, uh, but it sprawls into all right. Well, what about what about all the devices and all the all the points of access that might be uh, uh, possible to get to that data and the different breaches along along the way and the monitoring that's done from uh, uh, potentially getting that you know uh, important information out. So. Uh, there's systems and there's uh, uh, applications and there's different uh, different tie-ins uh, with all of them uh, that that can you know be that can be implemented after that very important discussion with your IT provider. All right, I see two more coming. Let's go to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Keith. This may be more for you. Um, let's let's assume a, a data breach, a cyber breach of the magnitude of Atlanta. Um, and you're bringing in outside IT consultants, you're bringing in outside lawyers, you're bringing in data breach coaches, you know, similar type experts. How involved are the claims management personnel at the insurance carriers at that point? Um, is, are they um, more involved, say, than the, than the typical type claim that they're getting across their desk when it's uh, a breach of this magnitude in your experience? I, no, that's a really great question. I, um, well, there's two sides of the house at the carrier. You have you have sort of the the claims response services, and then you have the coverage. So the coverage is not the coverage issues are really done in a letter about 30 to 60 days after the breach. So we can throw that out. That's essentially there, there's a wall between those two folks. What you want at a carrier is to have sort of every carrier calls it something different, but for normalcy, we call it a breach coach. So you reach out, and it could be an attorney, it could be uh, someone in-house at the carrier, and they're essentially your your quarterback for all your vendor services. Now, the way that the cyber liability is going now, it is it's becoming a, a very service-heavy and symbiotic industry, basically, where you have you, these vendors. Uh, the, the carrier wants you to have access to these vendors because they have pre-negotiated contracts. So they the, these carriers feel that they're getting the best price on their services because they're feeding them business on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, what I find is that the breach coach is very involved. You know, if, if, and, and if you want full service from a carrier, you want to make sure that the client is happy with the vendors because 
the carrier is going to say, okay, you should use this firm, you should use, I'm sorry, this law firm, this forensics firm, um, and if the carrier is not, if the client's not happy, you would hope that the breach coach would step in and either change the point of contact of the firm or change the firm altogether. So we like it when the carriers are very involved because they are the liaison between all of the vendors. And, and, as, we, and as I mentioned, carriers are getting to be very particular about the vendors that you use because, you know, for example, uh, Beasley Insurance Company saw, you know, I've seen numbers, uh, they, they handled 2,600 breaches last year. So they're the ones who are handling, uh, you know, they're seeing so much and they're interacting with all these vendors on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's, so it's uh, you want them to be very involved. So we hear about the city of Atlanta and we hear about major public companies or, or major companies like Target, but I'm going to go to David Taylor, who I know is a small business owner, who's going to come at this from a different perspective. What do you got for us? Thank you. Um, so I'm, I wanted to talk about a situation that happened this weekend. I was away with some friends and someone brought their laptop and we were watching the basketball game on a laptop and we're cooking food. And then all of a sudden, a couple minutes later, we look over at the laptop and it's no longer on the basketball game. Now it's on Amazon and you can see someone's mouse is moving and someone's trying to make a purchase on Amazon remotely. They had hacked into my friend's computer and I'm wondering where the liability and responsibility lies for uh, this because it was a work computer. She brought it away on a weekend vacation. She wasn't using it for work reasons and then this thing happened. I'm curious to know, I mean, interestingly, we saw it happen and shut the laptop down and disconnected, but like, is it her responsibility? Is it the company's responsibility? And what happens at this point? It could, you know, I, who knows how far the hacker got into her personal system and then if they can, if she's at the office now and connected to the office network, now they're just controlling her computer remotely. Just curious your thoughts on that. Well, um, the company that she works for, in theory, should have policies as to what you can and can't or should or shouldn't do with your equipment that's company issued. To the extent that they do have those, if it says that you should never use it for personal reasons, it may uh, open up a question that, you know, she was not acting appropriately. On the other hand, many companies do not have very clear policies on these things, and uh, the reality is that everybody uses their cell phone to check the scores and whatever. So um, if that's the case, it's the company itself technically that is responsible for cybersecurity. Uh, but in the United States, um, you may have noticed, but Congress has a hard time agreeing on anything. So the United States has never passed a federal cybersecurity law uh, that's broadly covering all industries. They've done it for a particular, you know, financial industry, healthcare, but they haven't done it broadly. So um, to deal with that, the Federal Trade Commission took a law that was passed back in World War I, <laughs> and they have broadly interpreted it to say that um, when people give personal information and private information to a, a business, there's a presumption um, that there is reasonable protection for that information. And if you don't do that, then it's a deception on the consumer uh, and it's a violation of the Federal Trade Commission Act. So that's actually the law that, that governs um, all businesses outside of the regulated industries. And so that would be what would come up in this situation. It would be a question of whether the company itself had um, taken reasonable steps, including employee training about what to do. <laughs> um, and if they hadn't, then potentially um, the company would have some kind of responsibility for the fact that something got in there. Love the questions. Keep them going. So you touched on it very briefly there. Um, what are, and, and really the, your, an organization's people are the ones, that's the front line. If you can prevent the cyber attack because your people are well trained. So what are some of the best practices, especially for a small business, uh, to keep your people in the loop, keep them always aware of, of this threat that's out there? I can, I can take that one. So we work with a lot of small businesses and you know, I, 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 I see that it really starts with, I think, an employee handbook, <laughs> acceptable use policy, 
are those, I think those are the two documents that you should really put together um, because it, it'll talk about things, um, you know, such as accessing, you know, Amazon, purchasing using credit cards on your, you know, on your work computer, you know, so, but there's also controls that should be put in place, you know, maybe there's things that you shouldn't allow users to, to do. I came from the federal government and the only thing I could do on my federal government computer was check the weather, okay? So a bit restrictive, a little difficult to navigate some things that you might want to look at the newspaper for, or the, the digital paper, but bottom line is you need to start with some policies to begin with. Um, and then from there, I, I think, you know, we have to start to enforce those policies. I, you know, passwords are awful. It's a terrible way to, uh, to allow access. But right now, most people are just using passwords, right? We're not using biometrics for the most part, right? We're two-factor authentication. God forbid we ask somebody to do something else to log on, right? So, uh, yeah, I think you have to look at really basic policies and procedures, password policies. But I also think that the, the big part is data classification. Looking at the information that you have, to the gentleman's question before, where it is, okay? And do you really need that stuff, <laughs> right? Can you get rid of things? God forbid we, we throw something away or delete. You know, it'll never come back ever again, right? But we need to limit, basically limit the amount of information that can be compromised. We also need to classify it. Healthcare information is obviously more important. So we need to classify that information and encrypt that information and store that information. You can't you know, protect everything. For a small to mid-sized business, you have to look at it really from a business perspective. How much is it gonna cost me to do these certain things and what will happen if I don't? All right, Ponemon and IBM have come out with studies. It still doesn't compel people, but it's about, about $140 per record. Would be, your, would be your potential risk, right? So one record with my name, date of birth, social security number, would, that would be a record. So if you want to multiply that by the amount of records that you have times 140, that's your potential for a data breach, the result, right? So sometimes, and in fraud, you know, we use 3%, 5% of your, 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 your gross uh, or about $150,000. So you really need to kind of calculate how much it's going to cost if something happens, and look at some very basic policies. And once you create this, this information security environment, which also pertains to paper okay, um, and devices, you start to kind of, I think, you know, stem the tide a little bit or have some change. It's really change management methodology. But you've got to start with some very basic policies going forward. Let's go to the insurance guy. Did you have best practices? Um, yeah, I think I can piggyback on that a little bit. I, I mean, I think these gentlemen are probably the best to speak to best practices in general, but I always find that, um, you know, making sure you know where your data is, like Jim mentioned to, to uh, that gentleman's point, but making sure that there is um, a segregation of data, too. You don't have, just make sure, just because you're all in the same network or you're all part of the same company doesn't mean you have to have that the that the data can span the entire network. You want to segregate that data, um, you know. And you know, of course, network vulnerability tests, pen testing. Um, obviously, there's no unlimited resources, so you want to take where your data is and what, what's your most. Uh, if it's PHI, uh, personal health information, that's going to be your most expensive. So you need to address that immediately. You know, standard blocking and tackling, making sure that there is. Uh, you're addressing your most important needs because there's really no um, silver bullet when it comes to that. It is each business is different. Yeah, I'm going to jump in real quick and I'm going to go back to you because I heard this at, at a different time and we can talk about this and, and go to your point on where your data is and where it is. How many people have a digital copier in their office? And someone made the point, anything that's copied or scanned in your digital copier, that's your leasing. In three years, you want a new copier, and you give the old copy machine back and you get a new one. That old copy machine has a copy of every single thing that you've ever copied or leased, which often has an incredible amount of personal information on it. <laughs> and, and just uh, on your point, there's a tendency, I think, for businesses, especially smaller businesses, to think that cybersecurity is a matter of technology. And it certainly is. It absolutely is. But... The reality is, and if you take one thing away from this conference, this probably ought to be it, 
of breaches that companies experience are through authorized users. It's your employees. <laughs> And you can put out all the technology in the world, you can put things in silos, you separate the data, you encrypt things, but it's your employees clicking on something, uh, opening something, and they're uh, sort of trained to try to be responsive to emails that come in. You're a service business, you're trying to respond quickly. Um, the best thing that a company can do on a cost-effective basis is have employee training where you show them these are the kind of things that come out there, these are what people try to do, these are some signs, these are some things to look for, and if your employees um, are much better at just not doing things that they shouldn't do, and they don't even realize they're not doing, then that's probably the single most important thing you could do to prevent a breach like this. Yeah, and the good thing is this has already been prepackaged for you uh, in a company called Know Before. Um, a lot of you probably even have phishing training. I think we've kind of alluded to what phishing is up here, but we not, haven't actually said it. Uh, this has been prepackaged, $20 per employee per year. You go ahead and sign up. And uh, the important part is that you do it initially. You send out some fake, uh, some fake emails. Um, and, but the, the important part is that you're, you're – uh, doing it on a, on a regular basis, once a month, once a quarter, whatever it is, to get those metrics on who is it, who are your, uh, who are your, your biggest risks individually. You have a, you know, you have a, a discussion with them as, as a business owner. Uh, let them know that you know, it's not just them, it's the whole company that they put at risk. Uh, and then some firms I heard, I think it's a terrible practice, they'll actually dock your salary or, uh, or your bonus at the end of the year. I don't agree with any of that. <laughs> yeah, what is the number? I think uh, thirty percent of uh, phishing emails are clicked on. Yeah, something like that. That's right. Um, so and it's always the same people. It's never, you know, it's not. Should we should we just fire them? I mean, are they too much of a liability? Yeah. Maybe they should just, you know. I think that's a yeah. southwest give them typewriters airline. and stuff. <laughs> All right, so let's go to. We talked about a presumption of personal um, information. What we were talking about before, what's coming in Europe, which may sound like Europe, but today everything's connected. Let's talk about, and I don't know the initials, so I'm going to let you guys handle it. Uh, 80 days, someone's mentioned it here. 58 days in county. I think if you go to the website, there we go. Tom, it'll, it's like the, it'll just count the countdown. I think it's like 58 days. All right, so, so what is it? How does it affect everybody in this room? Uh, well, the GDPR, it's the General Data Protection Regulation, and it's a massive regulation in the EU, which is primarily designed to protect people's data privacy. And it's sort of Europe's response to Facebook before Facebook happened. And it's driving everybody in Europe crazy who is a business who's trying to comply with it. But what it basically does is it gives individuals an enormous amount of control over their data and personal information that's collected by companies. Companies have to identify exactly what personal information they're collecting from you, what specifically they're going to use it for, and that's the only thing they can use it for, how long, once, it's, once that task is done, they have to delete it, and uh, people have the right to withdraw um, their information, they can send a notice saying, I want my information deleted from your system. And uh, I mean, there, there are certain backup abilities that people have to, to keep a, a storage copy to evidence what they've actually done with it. But it basically has to come off. And it's an enormous undertaking. Uh, but it's to protect things like Facebook, where information is being taken potentially or was taken potentially. But they're really uh, sorry about that, though. Uh, <laughs> they took out multiple ads. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, it's to protect against those kind of situations. And so how does this affect people in the United States if this is a European issue? Well, uh, Europe designed this and said that it applies to anybody, any company in the world that has personal information on EU citizens. And that includes information, not just the normal, like the equivalent of social security numbers or names and addresses, but also information on political leanings or sexual preferences or all kinds of religious issues, anything like that. If you collect that at all on uh, European uh, residents, you're potentially liable if you direct your business to Europe. 
if, you, if you're just sitting here in New Jersey and you have a website that happens to be accessible in Europe, but you don't really target European sales, you're potentially not going to be subject to this. But if, you're making, if you have information on your website for making sales that potentially converts to, to euros, that sort of implies that you're looking for European business, they can say you're subject to this. And if you violate it, and it's very uh, time intensive to comply with this, if you violate it, they can assess 4% of your global revenues for annual revenues, which is a massive, or 20 million euros, whichever is greater. <laughs> so it, it potentially is a big deal for companies in the US. And I know the big companies have spent tens of millions of dollars in compliance, like Google or, in theory, Facebook. <laughs> Questions? We got a couple more minutes yet. Yes, sir. Wait, hold on. Right, so obviously you have your profile information, and all of a sudden you have users. Someone said you can use their phone, and they often download apps that will, you know, they don't read the end user agreement. And we're having a conversation before about a Dragon Speakeasy in 2009, I believe, where they said if you download our text, a uh, voice to text speech app, we are automatically going to download your address book, your contact list. So there's tons of information there. So the question is, if you're uh, an employee who has uh, a phone, downloads all these apps, and these apps are not connected to your notes, which may be tied to your work-related accounts, to your content information for everybody in the company and other private information, how are you addressing, because uh, in our end, we kind of restrict apps and extensions, but how do you address that part of it in terms of, we got all the, all the things in place, the network is great, we have uh, you know uh, infiltration tests, we do all kind of phishing, scamming kind of, we have users who may very well be on their own, just downloading apps or integrated into their, to their services and they're collecting all this data. Um, are you addressing that? Do you have a recommendation? Uh, thoughts? I mean, the recommendation is just don't do that. <laughs> I mean, and, and companies have to direct you not to do that, but um, all these apps have these 17 page terms of use or license agreements and uh, with the exception of a handful of attorneys, nobody's ever read them. They just say, I accept, I accept, I accept. And like you say, they may say that you have agreed to, that we can collect data from you. And therefore, they're not violating anything when they take your data. You just have to avoid that from happening in the first place. So um, you have to try to put limits on uh, what gets loaded onto equipment that employees are using that will be able to access your system. I mean, if they have a home one, uh, you know, knock yourself out. But um, if it can access your system, it, uh, it also just could be a false malicious software that uh, let's make a game that looks attractive and get people to download it. And then we get malicious software into your phone. And then it goes into the system at uh, your workplace. And then all of a sudden, you have an Atlanta situation in your own business, so. Yeah, I think there, if, especially if it's a bring your own device uh, company, you know, I think we always recommend that you segregate the your personal side of the phone versus your work side of the phone with some sort of data protection, something like a, like a mobile iron or something that'll be able to segregate that data. Um, so yeah, something something that that allows for segregation. You know, I, I agree. I think it's really impossible to figure out which apps are legitimate and which apps are not, right? And I know that, you know, Android has had a lot of issues, so I'm not advocating Apple, but I am saying that it seems that's be a little more secure. Uh, I, I do think this BYOD, and I didn't coin this phrase, one of my technology friends coined it, bring your own disaster to work, <laughs> is really true. Uh, and how do we segregate, I, I think this leads to a bigger philosophical question, how do we segregate a person's user experience from their work and their personal experience? Right? How do we segregate that? Two devices. Who, who, how many people carry around two phones? Right. A few, right? You maybe won't admit it, but um, you know I think that's really inconvenient. I have trouble keeping track of one phone, so I, I think what we have to do is again segregate the data or, or limit the data that's available. Why can't you just access your your email on your phone? Probably enough, right? 
Um, you know, and I, I think that's, that's what we have to look at because there are a lot of applications that are difficult to figure out what they are. And like my mom, who I love very much, why did you get an iPhone? You, you realize you have to update your, your software like every couple of weeks and you don't know how to access your Wi-Fi at home? That's a problem, <laughs> right? But she's not doing very complicated things on her phone. But this is the problem. The users are the problem. How do we, so I have a phone at work. I have a phone, it's, I can access the, you know, work email. But since you don't own that phone as the, as the business, well, then how do you compel somebody to update the software in their phone, to patch it? It's very difficult to do that. This is a real big problem, and I, and I, and I think you've got to, you got to work around that and understand that there's a vulnerability there. So limit the access that the person has to their to your system, you know, on your on your phone. It's, it's easier said than done, but I think you really have to take that into account. All right, this has been great. We're respectful of your time. So we've been going an hour. So we're going to give each guy a chance for a closing statement. Uh, and then we'll let you guys get going. But we encourage people to stick around, ask questions, network with these guys, network with each other. We'll be here as long as you are. All right, so let's start, Keith, with the two takeaways that you'd want to press upon everybody here in the room. I think where we're going here with, with data security is that, you know, it's something that is, as far as the public conscience, I think Facebook is really the tipping point where it is something that needs to be on our mind and we need to create not just in our companies or in, in where we work, but uh, personally a, a cultural, a cultural, I butchered that, culture of awareness to make sure that you know that 24-7, 365, there is potentially your data is always at risk. So I think um, a culture of awareness at your company and on your personal life is something that's extremely important because it's not always the silver bullet as far as tech. You have these companies that say, well, what, what can I do? It is the training. It is the uh, making sure people are aware that what they're doing affects the entire company. Um, you know, I think I've, I've read recently that I think in the future, instead of in companies where they are really adding their IT department as part of the risk management, I think we could see the a cybersecurity department as part of large companies separate from the IT department, where they are separately approaching, uh, you know, working direct, reporting directly into the CFO to make sure that uh, they can have honest conversations with all the different divisions, where uh, and to 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 update their systems and make sure that that uh, people, folks are, can be completely honest with the type of data that's going on within their division. So um, I know it's a very broad thing to say, but a culture of awareness going forward. Yeah, sit down with your IT provider, your brother-in-law, whoever does your, your, uh, <laughs> your IT for your company, and, and just ask them, how are we protected, uh, you know, and, and see what they say back and, and see the different... Um, Technologies that you that you have in use, uh, the the types of cloud-based technologies uh, that are available now to secure your environments um, are are now bite-sized. Uh, they're reasonably priced for the small business. They're no longer enterprise costs. Um, so you should be thinking about making sure you're integrating your your two-factor and your your additional layers of sur um, security, no matter how. Um, uh, difficult they, they are for your end users to use, um, but make sure that, that you're taking those initiatives year over year. Um, also, I would, I would say that uh, what's important is passwords. Uh, with, with a $5,000 computer, you can crack a eight character password in six hours. Um, with a 12 character password, it would take you 100 years. So think about that and the passwords that you're using um, and the same one that you might be using for your bank, uh, that you're using for your computer, uh, and, and making sure that you're, uh, you're changing those on a regular basis, and that alone will save you headaches. Um, two takeaways. One is one I already mentioned, in that cybersecurity is more than anything about making sure your employees don't do something that they shouldn't do. And they're not doing maliciously in, for the most part, but they're just uh, clicking on things that look interesting or trying to uh, promote the business by responding quickly to things. Um, we go in and do cybersecurity uh, training for uh, employees of our clients, 
And I think it makes a big difference um, because, again, that's where 68% of the breaches come from. So if you can knock down that, you've, you've done a, a huge job towards uh, reducing your liability. The other is something for the future to bear in mind. It's the Internet of Things. Um, now we have smartphones, we have smart refrigerators, we have smart thermostats. Everything is smart. And when it's smart, it means there's an app, it's connected to the internet, it's connected to your servers in many ways often, and um, it, those devices have not been designed for security purposes, they're designed to amuse or to be consumer friendly, and that's a new path that um, cyber criminals are using to get into businesses or homes. Um, where they can access through your smart refrigerator or your smart TV a way to backdoor into your system. I, I would say for, for business people, you have to understand that information security or cyber security is something that you must now budget for. And, you know, it's important that somebody in your organization is the responsible party that can take ownership of this. And I, I think because of that, if you do that, I think a lot of these other things will, will fall in place because you are under attack. Your information either has been compromised or will be compromised. The likelihood and impact, it's up to your preparation, your planning, and your response. All right, great stuff, guys. Uh, special thank to our sponsors, uh, Arthur J. Gallagher, Linda Berry, McCormick, Estrabook, and Cooper, Sobel, a company, and Winning Strategies ITS. Thank you all. Have a great day. We'll see you at the next RI event.